This session will be chaired by Dr. Shukanto Dash, Program Co-Chair of ASCA 2023. I take the privilege to welcome Dr. Dash on stage and introduce Professor Rao. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Tunusri. A uh, very good afternoon in this afternoon session of day two. We are really proud to have Professor K. Ramachandran Rao among us. He is our invited speaker for this session. Professor K. Ramachandran Rao is currently a professor and MOUD chair in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Delhi. He works with Transportation Research and Injury Prevention Center, TRIPC, at Delhi. He secured his PhD degree in Transportation Engineering from IIT Kharagpur in 1998. His area of expertise is traffic flow, modeling, mass transit planning, and travel demand modeling, road safety, low carbon mobility planning. He's a well-known researcher in this field, and he did a number of works in the domain of cellular automata, use cellular automata uh, for modeling traffic. And when I was a student, I can recall that we used to uh, read his papers. So we are really, as I've said, proud to have him among us. So thank you, um, Professor Rao, uh, for giving time with us. And now it is time for us to listen, Professor Rao, so I invite Professor Rao here and take control of the dais. Please, Professor Rao. A very good afternoon to all. How are you? Good. Uh, I had a good lunch, so I was dozing off over there. So once I come here, I have to stop dozing. So now it will be your turn to doze. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Das, uh, for inviting me over. And uh, it's also my privilege to be with this community, which is uh, very much focused on cellular automata. And uh, without uh, further ado, let me start the talk. Can I do so? All right. Um, this talk is emanated from uh, the work that we have been uh, doing for the past many years. And it is accumulation of uh, the knowledge and some silly mistakes that we have done over the past. And subsequently, we kept on correcting as we moved along. And eventually, we are at this uh, point. OK, uh, now uh, let me first introduce this topic, uh, cellular automaton. Uh, when we started actually working, we didn't really know what it is. So like any other uh, new problem or a new kind of uh, domain, uh, it was quite exciting. For, from that point of view, um, I was uh, fortunate uh, to be one of the visiting uh, researcher in one of the leading groups in Europe where they do, did a lot of work on cellular automata. So this started from there. So this will be the outline. Uh, the topic is uh, cellular automata in vehicular traffic modeling. This is a very broad uh, heading. So in this, uh, I discuss on four aspects. The, the aspects are, uh, as shown here, Firstly, we talk about the, the problem setting in terms of understanding what is the CA and how it is going to help in terms of identifying the moments of traffic. 
Um, if you apply the problem largely to traffic dynamics, uh, there can be a different ways of doing it. Uh, but we uh, have focused largely on a vehicular traffic. That's the traffic dynamics of vehicles. We left out the pedestrians. That will be a talk for another day. Uh, we didn't work much on the pedestrian dynamics per se, uh, particularly the modeling side, although we collected a lot of data. Um, the first and foremost thing was our broad understanding and the kind of mistakes we tried to do. And subsequently, when we realized some mistakes are done, then we tried to rectify that. And subsequently, we further modified that. Um, both in terms of the method and uh, of course we did not do much research on the uh, CA as a method but we have applied one um, particular rule so hopefully as I go along uh, you will be in a better position to figure out whether this rule is still uh, good enough or we, we need to pull in more uh, rules which you people are quite actively working. Now, uh, these are some basic constructs of the CA. As all of us know, it's a discrete dynamic lattice system, uh, which has the time domain. With every uh, increment of time, the system changes. And there is a discreteness in the system and uh, uh, the distinctness in the system in the sense that uh, you can easily compare uh, with one state to another state. And the belongingness is clearer crisp. It's not fuzzy. So you have a object which is there in a lattice, it's there or not there. So that's the assumption. And uh, this is a small example which very often quoted, this is in the Australian desert. Uh, what happens here is uh, there are three animals which are there. On to the left is the dog, on to the center of course is snake and to the right is kangaroo. Um, as uh, the other two animals uh, realize that the predator is a snake. Uh, as they keep moving close to it, they realize that they are in threat and then they keep moving away. So that is reflected in this figure. And if you uh, trace out their positions with respect to time by giving certain indices, for example, dog, snake and kangaroo, DSK, then you see the uh, figure on the right, which shows with respect to time, the advancement of the objects as they move along. So this is a very early way uh, where uh, the people have used to capture how a uh, system can be uh, describing dynamically as the things keep moving. Uh, particularly in traffic engineering and traffic flow modeling, uh, things always move and we are very much interested to know the state of the system as of now and what is going to happen after an hour or after 15 minutes, 20 minutes and so on, given a set of rules. So that is the basic premise. Now, um, this is the same thing and initially I think this is a bit of history, I think uh, most of us know about it. It's uh, the CA is proposed by Ullman and Von Neumann. The traffic in CA was proposed by Kramer and Ludwig in the 80s and uh, 90s and subsequently uh, the, uh, this particular technique was brought into the traffic uh, literature by Nagel and Schreckenberg. That was in 1992. And then it simply has exploded. Uh, if you look at the uh, number of citations of that initial paper, it is running into several uh, tens of thousands. So for this, it's very important that we understand the neighborhoods correctly. Firstly, the neighborhood is about the one human neighborhood, which means that it is at right angles to the current position that we will try and look at it. Um, this is the uh, one dimensional movement. The blue cell is the one in question and uh, the neighborhood cells are the ones in the, the red color. Now, if you move to a, a mid block, for example, if you're far away from junction, this will be the scenario. But if you're at the junction, then you have turning movements. Turning movements will always be at the left, right or through. So this is captured very easily with that. However, these movements are not adequate to describe if pedestrians are moving. Obviously, pedestrians, although they have low motive power, they can move in all directions. Uh, theoretically, we can move backwards also. But we can move this way, this way, all, all directions. But vehicles predominantly move in 
uh, linear direction. So the third one pretty much uh, describes this. So you see the neighborhood, all the red cells. So these are all the possible places the pedestrian can go, but the vehicle can't go. This is a classically a, a kind of a, a circular disk model. For example, if someone is trying to do a parallel parking, how would you do it? If there is a vehicle here and there is another vehicle here, you first go forward and come halfway uh, to the back and then slowly get in and then come out. That's because you are unable to entirely swivel the wheels and then get in. You have to do two, three movements to get there. So that's precisely what this particular um, neighborhood is talking about. But whereas in case of pedestrians, there is no such thing. They can, uh, for example, they can be in this uh, blue state and suddenly they can be on the diagonal. But whereas car cannot, simply because of its uh, vehicle dynamics, it can't move. So these two are the ones which we will be carrying forward from now on. So the rule 184 system, uh, I think among the set of rules the Stephen Wolfram has given, this is one of those long list of rules. If you look at his book, so uh, this was uh, the, I think, in fact, the earlier researchers have picked this rule from there. And uh, how does it uh, happen? You can see the calculation there. There are uh, eight states and eight of the states is depending on the new state. It is multiplied by one, one into two raised to the power that position minus one. Okay. So th this is the neighborhood and these are the operations that are done in the rule. Now, the same rule uh, is shown graphically over here. That means when the state is changing, the corresponding states are changing. Now, this uh, same rule is applied in the, uh, the traffic seller automata. That is, you have these uh, four main ingredients and uh, the, the main ingredients are as follows. Firstly, the lattice in the space, including time, shape and dimensions neighborhoods, the cells surrounding the target cells, and transition rules. And when the rules are implemented local in each cell, what will be the state of the lattice when it is updated? That means all cells are uniform in size, and uh, they are having some neighborhoods, and there are certain ways of uh, progression rules and the transition rules. Now, we have to define those so that the vehicle progress is monitored in a, on a uh, time scale. Now, come to, coming back to the very first model, uh, I'll spend some time on this because this is the base model on which all the other models we describe or we worked on depends. Uh, this comprises of a, a periodic boundary, meaning the number of objects which are there within the boundary, they keep coming back over and again. That means if uh, you have a uh, put certain number of vehicles in the, uh, the lattice, they will not disappear. They may accelerate, they may decelerate, and so on, but the number will remain the same. That is a conservation. But whereas in the case of non-periodic boundaries, we'll come and see in a later point, it will be quite advantageous. We'll look at when it will be advantageous to do that. So these are the four set of rules. The most important rule is the third one. Now, uh, if I may say so, if this rule is not there, then the system will degenerate. Why? Because the, uh, the probabilistic nature all the time pushes the system into different states, which is unpredictable. Unpredictable meaning, of course, we know the probability function and its distribution. So you will know it could be uh, maybe a, a, a uniformly distributed uh, random number, which will be picked at a point and the probability is assigned. So every time, whether to uh, go, for example, if when you're on a road, if you're wanting to uh, move forward, it is entirely up to you whether you will want to move forward. Sometimes you may decide, I don't want to move forward. I, I may slow down. So how that is, that behavior is reflected. See, the automaton cannot just operate as a machine because it is replicating the human vehicle interaction. There is an individual that is sitting and driving or doing the two-wheeler and then progressing to the next state. Now, again, we have come a full circle. How? Now with the connected and autonomous vehicles, now the entire control is given back to the machine. 
So we'll discuss at the end. Uh, we didn't yet work on that, but we are slowly getting there. That's also another interesting facet of uh, the way in which we can uh, look into the traffic systems. Uh, firstly, uh, pardon me if the math level is very low. And secondly, it's mostly related to the traffic dynamics. So, uh, and a lot of emphasis on how the data is collected and validation is done. So that's how we as engineers, we would love to look at the systems which are uh, having evidence and they're corroborated with the field data. So the first, second, and fourth rules are about the, uh, the transition from one state to another. Say, for example, if you look at the acceleration, acceleration, of course, uh, the vehicles would li like to accelerate if there is a opportunity. That means if there are empty cells ahead, okay? Slowing down precisely for the same reason. No empty cells ahead, then you have hold back your uh, acceleration. And then vehicle motion is just, if nothing of these two works, it just keeps moving. The third one, the most important is the randomization. Okay, Th that's uh, this uh, eta t function, this is the random uh, deceleration factor, and this is a uniform random number between 0 and 1. Now, in the same paper, Nigel Schreckenberg's paper, it's very uh, insightful and uh, very intuitively done because it's, uh, it requires coding is very few lines, but you can replicate this. So what they did was they didn't draw any graph, but they let the computer do the, do the uh, trajectory. What's the trajectory? It's the plot between the time and space. Most of the traffic modeling is done with that. If you are able to know the trajectory, then you know the entire history of the movement. So that is what is here. So the dots will represent the empty cells and the number indicates the presence of the vehicle and the number is indicating the speed. Mind you, because this is all discrete lattice or a discrete uh, cells, how do we represent the speed? If I say speed is uh, uh, 30 kilometers per hour, it doesn't make sense here. So rather we will say the speed is so many cells per second, acceleration is uh, cells per second square and so on. Now, it is up to us, how are we going to define the cell size? In Europe and in many countries where there is a lane-based driving, and predominantly one vehicle type, this is fine. So this has led to the motivation of uh, adapting this particular model to the various other conditions, what we have in many parts of the world. So the basic model, it is one lane, no overtaking, circular, and it just keeps moving. But that itself is an extremely powerful model. In fact, uh, I thought I will, uh, I would like to show one experiment which is done in a circular lattice, uh, vehicles are going in circles and out of nowhere, the jams get generated. This is after the instruction given to the drivers, you exactly go at the same speeds. I think you can Google that and say circular uh, Japanese experiment of circular track. You will find that it's a very old video. You will see that suddenly the, uh, the shocks are propagated. That means that why it is that due to? That is because of the randomization. And not all the drivers are perceiving the same gaps in the same way. And suddenly some, somebody may be looking this way or that way, or just uh, didn't bother to go further. Then it is actually generating a, a shock upstream. Upstream means behind us. Downstream is looking down. Okay. So when these things happen, then those jamming phenomenon happens. So that is reflected in that. And also, So this is the first, um, uh, okay. There is an interference. Okay. 
Okay, this is okay. Okay, yeah, that's the interference. Sorry about that. So uh, the this particular uh, time space plot shows the trajectory of the vehicles, and clearly uh, the ones which are showing the uh, the number four is having speed of four cells per second, and five, six, and so on and so forth. You can specify how many vehicles are there at the beginning of the simulation run. For, that is called occupancy. For example, if you have 100 cells, let us say you put 10 cells. Okay, So you can say the occupancy will be a 0.1, 10 upon 100. So likewise, you can define the occupancy, which is nothing but the density. Okay. Now, after some time the system is run, then you see many zeros. Dot is a place where no vehicle is there, but what is zero? Zero is the place where there is a vehicle, but it stopped. So that means there is some kind of a, a jamming that's taking place, and that is nicely reflected in this. And this generates waves, which is called a shock wave. For example, if you go to the description of the shock wave, uh, using the wave equation in the uh, using a PDE, the second order PDE, then you will see that waves are generated, and this is that precisely that wave. So it is able to actually generate the traffic phenomenon in a fantastic manner. So that way, this is the model which is uh, I would say is one of the greatest model ever could have happened, which is very simple and it is exceptionally easy to code. And at the same time, it is generating all the useful traffic phenomenon, which the traffic engineers will see on the road. Now, people thought that, OK, this is a very simple model. And uh, it's only one lane. And it's only a lane which is having 7.5 meters, which is very constraining for us. So why would we say that 7.5 is constraining? Suppose if you are saying acceleration is 7.5 meters per second square. Can you imagine that acceleration? The maximum acceleration we can sustain may be about three or four meters per second square with a seat belt and all. If you're going at that speed, at that acceleration, maybe you should be a Formula One driver. Otherwise, you can't sustain that acceleration. So we decided that when we have to look at variety of accelerations, starting with a two-wheeler, which is a, a low acceleration, high acceleration but a low weight, and truck, which has a high weight and also acceleration is high, but overall it's Overall acceleration is low. So you see a variety of vehicles that we have to cover. Heavy motor vehicle, light motor vehicle car, uh, motorized three-wheeler, that's auto rickshaw, and then two-wheeler, motorized two-wheeler. So this entire spectrum of vehicles have to be covered. Then this model is simply not work. Because it always says that you have a fixed lattice of size, 7.5 meters. That's it. So this is from the engineering implication that this model will not work. This has led to the people looking at other ways of uh, circumventing the limitation. So we also uh, tried to do that. And some of the work related to this we are going to present. Of course, these are uh, fantastic other plots. This is called a fundamental diagram. The fundamental diagram gives you a, the traffic state at any given point. At a particular location, if you want to know what is happening to the traffic over a period of time, this is an easy way to look at it. This is a flow or a flux on the y-axis and the density or occupancy on the x-axis. What is occupancy? Occupancy is the one, so many number of objects on that entire lattice, that ratio. So it is unitless if you describe it in occupancy terms. But if you talk in density terms, it is number of vehicles per unit length. So that conversion is easy. There is one for a relationship that one can easily work it out. So likewise, they're able to, now if you look at the left-hand portion of this swarm of points, the left-hand side indicates the free flow state. As your density increases, flow increases. But that won't go on forever. It will stop here. Here suddenly the critical state reaches, and this critical state is the capacity. So if you see the road, when in the early in the morning, when the traffic picks up, more traffic goes, the more uh, flow gets, and more number of vehicles are added. But once you reach the 8 o'clock or eight, 10, 10 o'clock time, then suddenly we are going to this part. Then your density increases, and suddenly the throughput keeps falling. And it gets congested. So this left-hand side is the free flow condition. Right-hand side is a congested part. 
The same thing is reflected in terms of the density, that is cars per mile or occupancy. Both are the proxy of each other. The trend won't be different. It's just some proportionality constant you multiply. So one becomes the other. Otherwise, both are the same. So this is what is captured in the nagel schreckenberg model, which is a, a, a super and a uh, fantastic, I would say, phenomenological model. And it has led to the research of uh, the traffic uh, modelers taking cue from there and moving forward. So we were not left behind. And then we looked at some of the uh, models which are pertaining to the, uh, the uh, lane-based driving and uniform vehicle type, etc. But that's not going to help us because it is not capturing all the variations, particularly with respect to the road category and also with respect to the vehicle types. So hence, we looked at some of the how to overcome them. And um, forget about going to the junction. Even at the mid block, there are lots of issues. So some of the issues are listed out here. I don't want to read them. The important ones are measurable traffic characteristics and non-adaptability of data collection techniques. This is, again, another important challenge for most of the engineering community as to how we can collect data in an unbiased manner or a manner which is representative of the actual conditions. So which was difficult 15, 20 years ago when we actually started the work. But as we uh, trace the progress of how we have, our data collection has evolved, now it, we have come to such a stage, we are much comfortable with the way the data is collected. And we're able to collect the data what we want. And we're quickly able to analyze the data. That also I'm going to describe at the data collection issues. Okay. So now um, one is about the modeling and second about the data. So for that, we use videographic techniques and so on and so forth is a major source of the data at that point of time. And these are the limitations we try to overcome. The original model had 7.5 meters lattice length. Lattice length. Now, mind you, in India and other developing countries, you have the lateral stretch of the road. Say, for example, what is demarcated as a lane is occupied by more than one vehicle. In the uh, situations where this model is developed, was developed, the one vehicle occupies a across the width, only one vehicle is there. For example, in a lane, you will see only one car. You won't see a car in the same lane. But whereas in India and other places, you will see a car, you will see a two-wheeler. Or you will see a motorized three-wheeler or an auto rickshaw and a two-wheeler, motorized two-wheeler. So all these combinations are possible. Lateral occupancy of the vehicles is pretty much on. And what is the other requirement? Our requirement is from the traffic dynamics. It cannot reproduce the low accelerations of an auto rickshaw. Suppose if you want to put a speed breaker in a road, you don't have to do anything. You will let more auto rickshaws fly in the road. They'll slow down the traffic. Yeah, this is true. Because their motive power is not much, so they can't accelerate. And particularly if it is a slightly, uh, slight upward gradients are there, every traffic behind it will drag on. So that low acceleration has to be replicated and also the high acceleration of the cars. 7.5 meters can do good for cars, but not for other vehicles. So then these are all the limitations that we have. So we try to figure out. And also the behavior of the driving. For example, how do you drive? For example, if there is someone ahead of you, if the, uh, the driver is hitting the brake, you will be able to know whether the person is hitting the brake. We will be able to know because the brake light gets on. And that changes the behavior of the following vehicle. So this is the brake light model, uh, which is proposed by North Say, and we use that model. And we set up the rules, whatever are the four rules are there. We tweaked the, the lattice structure. How? We subdivided the 7.5 meters into 0.5 meters. So it can represent very low accelerations also. And how we can uh, trace the vehicle, whether it is moved within the lane from this end to that end. So we subdivided 3.5 meters. Mind you, for all of those who are here, uh, the lane widths are typically 3.5 meters to 3.6 meters or 12 feet. In America, it is 12 feet. In India, we adopt 3.5 meters or multiples of lanes. If you go onto the road and check reasonably, if there are public roads, meaning use the public funds, then they follow certain standard. That standard is 3.5 meters lane width in India. So there will be multiples of 3.5. 
So what we thought, we divided that into four parts, 3.5 divided by four. So that is the lateral width. So 0.5 in, across 3.5 by four. So that is the cell size. Now we can describe any vehicle. We can describe a two wheeler, we can describe a car, we can describe a motorized three wheeler, we can describe a truck. All possible vehicles can be described. But what we are compromising here is the speed because we are subdividing and making it fine grain. So it will take more time to, that means you're making it more and more. Uh, so it becomes kind of continuous. If you further subdivide and limiting to zero, then it becomes a continuous model, which will be very difficult to uh, manage. So this is after all a, a lattice based computational kind of a tool which simulates the situations. So all these behaviors are reflected in that. So we incorporate all those rules and uh, you see the cells as we have told you. So this is one lane. Lane is divided into four parts and uh, in the longitudinally each one of the cell is 0.5 meters. Now you can see here two wheeler is occupying how many? Four one 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 uh, one part of the one fourth of this and uh, uh, it is occupying this is just an approximation though uh, then uh, motorized three wheelers will occupy something and car of course it will not occupy 100 percent then it will occupy a little bit less or more all right now also in certain countries there are some driving rules what are those rules even in India, if you follow the uh, motor vehicle act strictly, then you can't overtake from the left. But in Indian roads, people overtake from all sides. So which means that we have to incorporate those rules to actually uh, make it more pragmatic and more replicating the field behavior. So then we allow the left, left overtaking, we allow the right overtaking. So all of that, then we see a uh, right front gap, uh, right back gap, and so on and so forth. So all of these are to be put in uh, this model, which can take it, um, take into queue all of these. And where we collected the data, some of the data was collected. And we had issues with the vantage points because we have to have, see a stretch of a road. And then uh, even if the video is there, there are no ways which uh, the traffic trajectories can be done. So there was a startup which uh, they said that they will be able to do it based on the image processing they were able to capture the vehicle uh, by some grids and they put a center of the grid and they, they trace the pixel movement uh, with every frame and then they gave us trajectories. So this was the way it was operating. Before that, it was much worse. What we used to do, we used to project on a TV and we used to literally go with the tape and measure. And that measurement, we have the ground coordinates and we used to replicate them. Now it's reasonably easy because we uh, calibrate this screen by defining the coordinates at four points and that is fed into the software and it will automatically give you the actual trajectories in terms of the ground coordinates. So this is a, a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say it's complicated, it's a laborious process, but that has to be done if you really have to uh, track the vehicles correctly. So this we have tried to do and uh, then we did all of that. And of course, we uh, developed the model and we tried to validate. These are only aggregate validations, meaning that something which is entering its traffic stream at a location A, it's getting out at location B, that kind of aggregate validations. These are easy to do. That's what we realized later. And uh, along the way, we realized that we made some mistakes. So then, uh, now the, this work is done, PhD awarded, then the next PhD started. Of course, we did come up with a, one interesting uh, metric, which is called area occupancy. What it tells us is linear occupancy is something what we have seen, so many vehicles per kilometer. But that's not going to help because vehicles are moving laterally. So then we realize that this has to be a row, which is over the area that we defined. And this is something which was initially looked very skeptic, but almost most of the people use this metric now. So this was a simulation model setup. And when the next student started, then the student tried to figure out whether the earlier models uh, were doing good or not. Obviously, they'll find some loopholes and then they start. So our work, we criticize our work and then we see that when the vehicles are going, they just don't go left and right. 
they stick to certain lanes. This is what we found out. How do they stick? For example, trucks, they stick to a particular lane where they get undisturbed, particularly on the highways. Because they don't want to get disturbed by the side uh, exits and entries. So likewise, two-wheelers. Likewise, three-wheelers. So every vehicle has one tendency to adhere to a lane. And anything deviation from that is will cause a deterioration or will be a, a suboptimal performance. So that one we realized and we did some experiments. Of course, these are the deceleration, then uh, uh, the stationarity, and then brake light and lane change. These are all the probabilities. And also we have to define how much gaps one has to allow if you want to move. So these are all defined. And uh, for each of the vehicle type, motorized two-wheeler, motorized three-wheeler, which is auto rickshaw, car, and truck. Four categories we started. And then we defined the acceleration cells per second square at the speed of 5.5 meters. So you see this, um, the speeds and the, the accelerations. We have seen if the original model is followed, suppose if you validate microscopically, that means if you look at the trajectory of each vehicle, unfortunately, there is no match. So then we realized suddenly their queues are building up with the old set of rules. So then we thought these vehicles are unnecessarily getting stuck because they are assigned to the wrong lane. So then we said that let us kick it out of this lane and uh, the vehicle will uh, move free. So that way we uh, had assumed some safe uh, stopping distance and also uh, the deceleration of the other oncoming vehicles are not considered. So these three were incorporated and then the new rules were set. So this, again, we had gone to Ludhiana. The earlier one was in OIDA UP. And uh, this one, we were able to see this. So we could see, again, we wanted a vantage point and we could get a foot over bridge and we installed a camera and we did the uh, data collection. You can see uh, the road looks empty, but uh, as the day progresses, then things get very difficult. Now, this is a very important thing. This is, what is this plot? It is a box plot. In the box plot, you can have multiple categories. And you see that light motor vehicle, the distance moving away, our simulations are the ones in the light color and observations are in the dark. Now, there is a complete uh, deviation from the simulations if you look at the, um, the auto rickshaw and the motorcycle. So that means whatever we are predicting as the lanes they are going, that's not stick, being stick to. So this is a very uh, useful insight that we get from the simulation model. And then we have to modify the model. So for that one, we again updated the rules. And uh, uh, the other student uh, who started working on this, funnily, he wanted to name this model uh, after the initials of the two uh, first authors of the previous models. And then he tried to compare. They were only having comparable observations at this part. Of course, in the simulation, the best part is you can generate the traffic even in the congested portions. You won't be able to see that in the field. The advantage of the simulators are this. You can go up to this part. That means you increase occupancies, you can still go here. Similarly, we wanted to do the, the speed versus the flow. Again, the same problem. Now, again, we further said that, look, these are the multiple gaps that are there. Then we define the longitudinal lateral gaps because they are allowing the vehicles to go all over. And then we developed the new set of rules where we set the targets, it can go left, right, and through on a road, not at the junction. So what it means is it can uh, take a, uh, the left way, uh, the overtake from the left, and or follow in the center or overtake from the right. So this was the rule that was followed. and. The comparisons were made. So, this is the we uh, named this model as a position preference cellular automata model. That means we assign positions to a vehicle type and they can kind of tend to stick to those lanes, which has been uh, the learning from the field data. So, we modified that and this performance has slightly better. Now, we also looked at the interactions of different types of vehicles. For example, Heavy vehicles with the two wheelers, heavy vehicles with the three wheelers. The interactions of the same vehicle types are more. For example, if you are having a truck in the front, if you, if you are in a car or a two wheeler, you will try to avoid. 
going behind because the truck cannot see you. Okay. And the similar vehicle types tend to stick together. So those are called the interactions. So those are traced from the, the field evidence and also from the simulation. So that is the part two. Now part three is we said that the, some issues are there. We try to resolve on the original model of mid block. Now we said we have done enough of mid block. Let us try and look at the junctions. So then we had gone to the junctions. Junctions are equally problematic and the data collection devices are different. Earlier we were okay with a, a, a camera and then a software to uh, do the video image processing and, do, and so on. But now the challenge is a little bit different because as soon as the vehicle uh, approaches the junction, it decelerates and then stops and then it starts. So what happens is at every turn of the red light, there is a periodicity. For example, the traffic, uh, it goes in a circle on the, for all the approaching roads. Again, it reaches the original state. So that it generates kind of a waves at every green. So in the upstream, you will have the shocks which are propagated. But microscopic model can pretty much follow the original uh, logic of the uh, nagel Streckenberg, close lattice, fix number, and do it. But really close lattice, does it make sense? We found out it doesn't make sense, particularly if you're having a junction. Why it happens so? The moment you generate the vehicles, and again, we pull back and again, put it back. After some time, you see a degeneration, no matter whatever rules you apply, because the same set of vehicles keep coming back to all the three other approaches. So then we uh, did a detailed study on what kind of lattice is going to help. So that was a comparison we made for open and closed boundaries. So there is extensive work that was done. By the way, uh, we don't have to feel very happy because there are a lot of simulators which you can be open source. For example, you can go to Sumo and you can develop your entire um, uh, modeling on this. Matsim is another one. It is activity based. So likewise, there are many open source things. Of course, the commercial ones, our students will love to use this vision. And Ameson also is there. Any logic with some limitations. So we tried to explore all of this, but uh, we figured out that this is the one which is coming close, but this is no good as far as uh, our conditions are concerned. So then we decided, okay, let's do the microscopic simulation ourselves and then look to overcome some of the limitations. So this was the video I wanted to show where the vehicles keep moving. And uh, these are of course the, uh, the objects which are done by simulation, but you can see the, the Japanese car experiment. So please Google after the, uh, the talk and see how interesting it is going to be. So in this, we thought that simulations are done in the closed loop and so on and so forth will work for a mid block. And we have found out literature is equally for and against in case of the junctions. So then we decided to do a, a study. Firstly, we have to collect data. So we have uh, many uh, locations in Delhi, some locations in Delhi, some in Mumbai, we tried to collect the data. We had to understand how the vehicles are approaching the junction. And then after the approach, how are they getting processed? For example, is there a zone of influence? So all of these factors we got to incorporate in the model. So we did try to look at it. Some of the equipment we used, this is a new kind of a bird's eye view, which has a, a simple camera can look at maybe a 100 or 110 deg uh, degrees, but this will almost can look like a, a 130 or 140 degrees, a very small one with a telescopic boom. It can look like a much larger, that will be useful for a junction because it can look much more. But now we see that limitation also is resolved. So these uh, devices we use. This uh, GPS, of course, nowadays we have in phones. But this is used to identify what is the trajectory of the vehicle which is coming and stopping at the junction. So we did do the study. And uh, data extraction, of course, we did. And uh, this is a tool the student has developed in the MATLAB. And uh, you can use it. I think it's there in the, the students. Uh, page, you can use it free. Uh, you can click a particular vehicle type and you can find its trajectory. You will get a text file for this. You can have any type of video, top down video, uh, sideboards video, it will work for most of them. So some of these questions were uh, bothering us as to how many types of drivers exist, whether the drivers are very aggressive when they approach the junction. So we had to work our way in terms of understanding that. So for that, uh, we did a thorough review of the literature and subsequently we got on to the work. 
Now, boundary conditions, as I've already told you, uh, the one is a periodic boundary condition, which we already are using as a Nagel Schreckenberg, but that's not going to help. So, this is the periodic boundary. That means it's going from here and again coming back. Then we thought that this may not be a good idea. So we decided that we will go with the, uh, the non-periodic or open boundaries. So that the vehicles which are exiting from the junction, they die out. Like your um, automata or you generate the vehicles using some uh, random numbers. But the same things won't come back. So you will have a new set of vehicles which are coming at every junction. But you can decide their speeds, you can decide how they're accelerating, all of that. And you define the set of rules. So uh, also we have noticed one important thing, vehicles seep. In fact, you will be very interested to know in the countries in Far East, Vietnam, uh, Thailand and other places, their uh, two-wheelers are legally allowed to go and stand in the front because they're the ones to very quickly accelerate. Let me tell you, the ones which can fast accelerate very quick, if they're starting from rest, if you put a truck, car and a two-wheeler, two-wheeler will accelerate faster. You know the reason why? because of its lightweight. So their power to weight ratio is a very critical thing. For the truck, power is good, but weight is quite big. So it won't be able to accelerate. So P by W ratios for the vehicles is important. So if you want to optimize the green time to throughput more and more flux, then you have to do something so that you allow the vehicles to see. But in India, the driver themselves find a way and they do this uh, seeping business. So they, nowadays, of course, they're also uh, hitting the pedestrians also because they're jumping onto the footpaths. So that's a downside of this seeping. Okay. So the seeping behavior is incorporated and all these, uh, again, we look at all the gaps. Now, importantly, if a junction is there, how far its influence upstream? Means if you have a junction, how far behind its influence is there? Downstream, because the moment the vehicles are left in the platoon, they're at a free flow till they reach the next junction, okay? So we tried to look at the trajectories with the GPS. We didn't really find any particular trend, but we found out a array of distributions. Some people were saying drivers are mild, drivers are normal, drivers are aggressive. We found an entire distribution of them. So we tried to incorporate that in a model. And that zone of influence, we eventually said that, okay, this could be the possible range from the zone of influence. And beyond this, the vehicles won't have any zone of influence. So we have to consider this, the simulation up to this part. So anything beyond is not required. Now coming to the data. In fact, the prelude to all the data collection was the massive project by a next generation simulation, which was done almost like 20 years before in the uh, USA, where they've uh, taken one stretch and with high definition cameras, they were able to take the video of individual stretches and they were able to stitch them by mosaicing all of those images. And they developed the trajectories. If anyone wants to get the trajectories, you can go there. Even now, it's very extensively used trajectories. You can go and download them. And I think it's for 20 or 30 minutes, but it's very detailed trajectory. And of course, now you have a lot of such trajectories available. For example, there is a Chennai trajectory, there is a Surat trajectory, all the urban uh, vehicle trajectories are there. This is for researchers who want to do the work. We did try to look at them, but however, we wanted to find our own. Now, we started with the uh, the cameras on the uh, the uh, the footover bridges, simple cameras, DVs. So we are done away with the magnetic tape. Now we have a uh, the SSD based ones, which have a, a very good storage. Now. Uh, all of this said and done, we still have a problem because we can't really see that sufficient road width. Now that problem is solved. How? You have UAVs. So they're very simple. Now I think it's used in all recreational activities. All the weddings are short in this. So why don't we use for research? So we have that with us. Now we are uh, kind of getting there. And uh, you can go as much high as you can. But of course, there are the DGCA guidelines. For those of you who are wanting to be very creative, you have to be careful because you, for a certain weight and for certain zones, and red zones you can't operate, particularly where the flight paths and all are there. So there are some set of rules. So for these kind of research related thing, 
I don't think these rules will really uh, restrict you because you can go to the locations which are not red and where the restrictions are not there. And of course, you can't have a very heavy drone flying unless you have a license. So these are other issues, but I think most of the students can um, work with that. And subsequently, then we have, uh, we were successful in getting the video, but video is obtained again, the same problem, who is going to give us the trajectories. So there is a fantastic uh, service. I think it's one of Czech Republic. It's called data from sky, something God has sent. So you just send the video, they will send within using all the AI and ML tools. They will send you the trajectories in no time. They charge say X amount of euros for a, a certain duration. It's not very expensive. So we found out and we found they're very accurate. So this is one of the, uh, for example, if you look into the detail, they tell the location and they tell the vehicle type, they're identifying the vehicle type. They say auto rickshaw, no problem, we'll identify. So they have that uh, AI and machine learning tools who can get there. This is amazing stuff. So any one of you who wants to actually play with the actual data, you can collect using the UAVs and you can quickly get them processed. And you can use that to calibrate the models. The models without calibrations are possibly the dumbest models you can ever think about. Your, um, uh, the CAA uh, wise, your model can be fantastic, but if you want to really make it uh, applicable, or if you really want to apply, then you have to use the real data. And where do you get the real data? This way. And how do you do that? Get it and then completely get the coordinates or trajectories. Once you get the trajectories of the vehicles, then you can easily work with them. Once you, then you can get the accelerations, you can get the speeds, you can get the, uh, the all the entire history of the vehicle in the entire observation. So roughly we worked out a formula. For example, uh, you can look um, at a 1.5 meter, 1.5 X times the height you're flying. For example, drones, you can go maybe up to uh, 100 meters. So you can look at a 150 meter length of a road. Drone hiring at it, 100 meters. There's how many stories high? More than 30 stories, 30 floors. So we can fly a drone up to that point. So, and our, luckily we have the drones which have 4K cameras. So they're also very uh, fine grained and you can get very great detail. If the image is poor, then the detection will be poor. So that is what we uh, have learned in a hard way. So that way we found out that the data collection issues are also resolved with the UAVs. So you can get everything with this. Now, only thing is, how are we going to improve our modeling? Now the data collection has improved and there is no problem. You can store as much data as you want because your uh, drive storages and all have increased many folds and so on. And this is the trajectory they supply besides this picture. So you have the entire spreadsheet or the text file, which is given by data from sky. So this is what we are trying to use. But now is it good enough? No. Now the interesting things is you, uh, the uh, connected and autonomous vehicles have come. Uh, I'm okay with the time? Time, time. Yeah. Uh, the, I, this is the last one. Now we also found out that the now connected vehicles, they can't come all alone on the road. Already the existing vehicles are there, so there will be a mix. That is uh, the connected and autonomous vehicles and human driven vehicles. So there will be a mix of the regular vehicles. So you can't say that all these vehicles go out. No, we don't want them. It's not going to happen. So they are going to be there, but slowly the, for example, with all the uh, advanced cruise control, some of the vehicles are coming these days. They're there on the road. Now more sophisticated they become. The complicated behavior of both these types will become tricky. Again, here also CA models are used. So this is one of the paper we've seen. They've used this and you see the different types of uh, vehicles they're representing. There is also one more. The important thing is what kind of behavior you want. For example, is it a cooperative behavior? For example, you will uh, cooperate with the autonomous vehicle or you will compete. If you'll compete, no, no, I will go first before that vehicle. So that is a game theory will play out there. Yeah. So you will see the cooperative cruise control is one easy way where the entire throughput will be maximized or competitive. So these set of rules will define how our flows are going to be. So then this is one uh, picture that we get it. Interestingly, as the society progresses, 
you will see the penetration levels of the uh, autonomous vehicles will keep on increasing. For example, today, let us say, um, in India, the car uh, ownership is very low, less than 10%. Or 5% of the population owns the cars. Now, if the car ownership slowly increases and suddenly reaches like 80 or 90% of the people own cars, then our roads simply won't be sufficient. Likewise, the autonomous vehicles, their market penetration is say, um, 10%, 40%, 60%, 80%, and 100%, then how this, uh, the gaps are going to be in terms of the cells? What are the cells? These are the CA model, original lattice. Okay. Now, what is the implication of this on the throughput? This is what will happen. That means as the penetration level increases, you see the human driven vehicles means uh, are zero percent that means it has reached to the top that means you are expected that the flux or the throughput will increase that means all are autonomous they will accept the narrowest of the narrow gaps so more and more vehicles will go but in india that's what we are doing always so uh, we are more better than cavs because they are managing with very small gaps i mean just a joke uh, so we have to see how uh, advantages it is offering and you see the the CAV penetration versus the capacity units. Suppose if the CAV penetration is um, the automatic, uh, these uh, advanced cruise control, so it is going to, the capacity is going to increase as the penetration rate is going to increase to 100%. So this is where you have to be looking at and think about whether we want that point or not. Okay, we have come to the end of this. So the overall summary is the original CA model is not going to work. So we have to do lots of modifications for making it work for the conditions which are different from simple one track CA because you have to overtake, you have to use multiple lanes and so on. And at junctions also we have to change the boundary conditions and on. And data collection uh, methods, they have improved tremendously. So we are, all the shackles we have had, we are unshackled. It means we don't have any issue with the data collection. And lastly, the CV, CAV and HD mix is something which needs further investigation. We are something trying to work on this. Of course, it is not possible on my own. The first one I got in tech point is Professor Michael Streckenberg. Then these are uh, first PhD students, the second, third. So the current one, he just graduated in uh, 21, I think. Okay, uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao, this, for this wonderful talk. So I think we all have enjoyed. So maybe we have some questions. We can take some questions. Okay. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, my question is like, uh, you discuss about heterogeneous lane, correct? Uh, so in this heterogeneous lane, uh, when uh, you discuss about like, uh, maybe some lane, more, tra more uh, like car or maybe uh, some uh, vehicle is there, and some lane, maybe few vehicle is there. So uh, how this like uh, how we develop a med model so they can like the so lane is actually totally like maybe more vehicle is there how they understand uh, that the uh, other pain other lane is uh, like less vehicle and they ship the lane from one limb to another. Yeah, lane. Have been developed. So we use some of those logics and we incorporated that. So there, if there are multiple lanes, invariably the lanes interact. That okay. we have to always incorporate in the model. So we have to have a multi-lane CA. Okay. Okay. And one more thing, sir, is uh, for uh, heterogeneous uh, lane also, like uh, you discuss like uh, for uh, null bound, like uh, null boundary CA, it's more uh, useful. Oh, you're saying uh, periodic. periodic. Compared, uh, compared to periodic boundary, null boundary is more uh, are, are, you, are you asking whether they're useful? Uh, yes. The actually, periodic boundaries are excellent if you have a mid block. Okay. Because your uh, simulations are done very quickly. Yes. But non periodic are not so much uh, useful in that. But periodic boundaries are useful in the mid blocks. If you have junctions, then periodic boundaries we had difficulties. So we had to go to the open boundary. Okay. For open boundary, if I want to simulate the traffic behavior, then how much lane you have to consider? Like uh, for one junction to another junction, like from one junction to another junction? No, that's why we done that influence zone of influence. Okay. So we collected the data and we found out what is the 
uh, upper limit up to where we have to look at the behavior okay. and track the vehicle. Okay. So for that, you have to do a bit of the behavioral study, or we can follow the research and take some distance from the junction. So up to that point, only the behavior will be that vehicle's influence will be in the junction. Okay. Uh, that, no influence. Okay. Uh, last question, sir. Uh, for uh, open boundary condition, uh, can we use the NS model like NS model concept that we can? It's applicable for NS model. No, Nagel Steckenberg model is the basic model. Yeah. I, I think you have to modify it much beyond. Yeah, it's modified version. Like uh, for NS model, like if V max is five, correct? Maximum velocity is five. Maximum velocity is V max is five. No, model. that you can always overcome by uh, subdividing the uh, the cell length, okay. which we have already done. Okay. 0.5 meters will uh, work in all conditions. You can also change it, but for all the acceleration the vehicles in India, that is good enough. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Yeah, one question is online. R.K. Goyal, it is traffic models have also been developed using agent-based modeling. So what does the crucial difference lie between CA-based models and ABM-based modeling? Okay. It's a very interesting question. Actually, uh, the agents themselves are the automatons which are attributed to some behaviors. For example, pedestrians uh, are modeled typically using agents. So CAs are the agents which uh, have very limited uh, limitations in terms of the way in which they go. For vehicles, I think that's good enough. So if, whether you use agents or CAs, I don't see much difference. Thank you. Any more question? So from, from my side, one question. Yeah. So you are discussing about uh, Nigel's Kuchenberg model. It is excellent, you know, insightful. Uh, and some people, they have tried to use uh, this NS Nash model for uh, modeling uh, internet traffic, even network traffic. Internet traffic. Yeah. So what is your uh, you know, feeling? Uh, will it work for internet traffic, even? Um, actually, you have to see uh, how the packets are coming and what is the their distributions. It could be, uh, I mean, you have to identify what kind of uh, the behavior they are uh, having and what is the rate at which they are coming. Internet traffic, for example, um, you have to see how, how simple a distribution is. If it is a very complicated distribution also, you can still manage, you have to check that. In fact, the idea of open closed boundaries, we got it from the the uh, the requests that are received from open and closed systems, which is based on the information technology. Yeah. That that one only we used here. Open closed one. Yes. Right. 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 Okay. So thank you once again, Professor Rao, thank you. for this wonderful session. I think all of you enjoyed. So uh, thank you once again for coming here. Thanks. So from uh, from the organizing committee of ASCAT, we have a small token for you. So. So please, sir. Our cordial thanks to uh, Dr. Dash also. With this, we have completed our first session of this afternoon. We'll assemble here at 4 p.m. And I would request our online participants uh, to also join at the same time. Thank you for joining. Yeah, sure.